All right. So hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Book Cafe podcast. Um, in today's episode, we will be talking about the book entitled The Emergence of Islam, Classical Traditions in Contemporary Perspective. And my conversation partner for this episode is Professor Dr. Gabriel Said Reynolds from the University of Notre Dame. And as a lot of you who have been with the show for a while now, will remember Dr. Reynolds from episode four, where we spoke about this book right here behind me entitled Allah, God in the Quran. So definitely do check out the, that episode after you've watched this episode or listened to it, because it, it's one of our most popular episodes on the show. And uh, today, in fact, this particular episode happens to be our 25th episode uh, that we're recording. So it's extremely wonderful to have a, an old guest and an old friend of the show back with us. So without further ado, let me first introduce our guest, uh, Professor Dr. Gabriel Said Reynolds. Hi, Gabriel. Welcome back. To Hello, Book Cafe. I'm so happy to be back. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Book Cafe podcast. Uh, I love the diversity of your content. I love your openness, the way you engage with thinkers from different perspectives, always with open mind and open heart. Thank you for having me back. Certainly. And thank you so much, Gabriel, for your graciousness, because uh, when we started the channel, um, you know, I have to say that you were the first academic uh, scholar that we had. So the first serious academic scholar that we had on the show. And uh, I remember that we had a, a very iffy internet connection that day. But uh, and if you had said no to that particular episode, I'm not sure if I would have even continued with the show. So our thanks oh, to you in particular for your graciousness, your kindness, and everything that you've done to support all that we've been doing at Book Cafe Podcast over the past one year. So thank you. Once thank you. Again. Thank you. Okay. All right. So Gabriel, uh, coming back to the book itself. Um, so the emergence of Islam, um, as I understand it, that this book actually came out originally in 2012, and a, a second edition came out uh, this year in 2023. So the yes. first question that exactly. So the first question I would have, Gabriel, is uh, what was the reason for the second edition? And what new content can readers expect from this uh, second edition as compared to the first edition? Maybe we can just Great. take that. Yeah, yeah. Terrific. So, the, I mean, there are two there are two basic um, inspirations for the new uh, new edition, and they one relates to advances within scholarship surrounding the emergence of Islam, and the other relates to what's been going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the the first the first bit uh, basically concerns all of the remarkable uh, advances that have been made in understanding the historical context of Islam's emergence. And especially the work of scholars like Ahmed Jalad, who have been studying the pre-Islamic um, Arabic slash Arabian inscriptions in modern day Saudi Arabia, principally a little bit also in Yemen and Jordan. Um, and uh, that's really um, shed new light on the religious environment or the religious milieu in which Islam emerged. Um, and as you probably know, I mean, a lot of these inscriptions, they're coming out like every year, mm -hmm. new studies, new discoveries, new inscriptions. A lot of it is being uh, published initially on social media. But then Ahmed Ajalad, Christian Robin of France and some other scholars have been uh, sort of very carefully thinking about the implications of these new inscriptions for Islam's emergence. And then the, the other main feature or the inspiration for doing a second edition it's just the way the world is changing. So chapter eight in the book, which is the longest chapter, is about contemporary perspectives on Islam's emergence. And it's kind of cool, like an interesting question or way of sort of an optic for looking at Islam's emergence, not only like what would a historian say really happened, but how do different Muslims today understand Islam's emergence? What are the consequences for their understanding for the way um, they think of Islam today? So, uh, yeah, there's a lot in there about, on the one hand, um, sort of Islamist, Salafi, Salafi, Jihadi movements like ISIS, mm -hmm. um, like the Taliban, right. who, of course, were around before, but are sort of re-emerged. But then on the other hand, different currents in progressive Islam. So progressive uh, Muslims who have been engaging with questions like the LGBTQ issue, um, different understandings of the secular state, what, what it means, or really in defense of secularism, um, and those sorts of ideas. Um, so I tried to you know, introduce that uh, that topic, that sort of lively, dynamic discussion among Muslims today in Chapter 8. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And of course, we will definitely get to that part, Gabriel, as you mentioned the Taliban. I think you also, uh, you also had 
a bit to say about uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founding father of Pakistan. So that's definitely something we have to talk about. But just coming back, um, Gabriel, to the uh, to the first few chapters. So as I understand it, having had its opportunity to read the book, you're presenting not just the traditional narrative, but also the historical critical narrative. And you have them both uh, here side by side. Um, is this? Would you say that this is actually one of the first uh, books or first textbooks that actually does paint both these two pictures side by side in one volume? Uh, would you like to enlighten us about that? Yeah. I would say that there's a lot of work from one perspective or the other, but maybe I mean I, I sort of hesitate because it may sound presumptuous or arrogant of me to say, well, I've done something no one else has done before. But I mean, even like there's a work by uh, Frank Peters of New York University where uh, he speaks about Islam's emergence. And he does introduce there in the beginning um, some you know critical ideas, but then he sort of just resorts to telling the traditional story um, as most Western scholars would tell it, sort of uh, take out some of the supernatural elements and tell the story as it's traditionally told. So yeah, I mean, I guess that, I mean, for the first edition, uh, when people ask me, well, why why another book on Islam's emergence or early Islam? That that was my answer. That it brings these two together, and um, I mean, it's I, I kind of present it as though it were um, kind of one or the other. But of course, it's it's more complicated than than that because um, you know there are different. Uh, there's diversity within the traditional narrative, different perspectives um, among the classical authors. So there's, you know, there's so many akhbar, uh, so many reports um, in the hadith uh, books and then in the sira books um, about the life of the prophet and the life of the companions. So there's diversity there. And then among so-called historical critical scholars, I mean, there's fierce division. So mm -hmm. it's really more complicated. And I, I try to present um, what, what I see as like the most prominent, the, the most well-known ideas in each right. camp and bring them together. Okay, all right, okay, fair enough. So I, I should definitely uh, correct myself. Of course, uh, Professor Frank Peters, uh, I recall that he, he usually goes by F.E. Peters as well, if I'm not right. mistaken. Exactly. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And he wrote a two volume book uh, called The Monotheist. And I'd actually read that a long, long time back. I think uh, more than 15 years back when I was still a student in Canada. So anyways, uh, just coming back to uh, the book, uh, uh, Gabriel, uh, with regards to the traditional narrative of Islam, so if we can just rudimentarily just uh, talk about the timeline. So we have the Prophet Muhammad's traditional birth uh, birth year being the year 570 AD, yes. uh, which is about 500 years from the time the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. So uh, just, just to throw this out there, uh, was 570 picked for that particular reason that it, it happened to be 500 years from the time of the destruction of the temple, would you happen to have an opinion on that, for example? Right. It's, a, it's actually a really good question. It's something that people people take for granted, uh, at least, you know, when operating in an academic context or a Western context where the uh, the common era dates are used or the AD dates are used. Uh, it's just people, you know, mention the date 570 without actually asking. To, gosh, I think it was a scholar named uh, Lawrence Conrad who did a study of the date of Muhammad's birth. Um, it's complicated within the Islamic calendar, and then it's complicated within the so-called Christian calendar as well. Um, so, but I mean, this the standard uh, idea about how that date is calculated for Western scholars is uh, it's just it's just counting back from the date of uh, the Prophet's death in 632, usually mm -hmm. given as 632 according to the AD calendar. And, um, you know, most of the reports, although there's diversity here as well, uh, have the prophet living 62 years. Of course, there's a problem there because there's also a difference between the lunar calendar, which is used by the Islamic um, sources, which has a shorter year than the 365-day solar calendar. So there's there's all sorts of bits of calculation that have to be done. But it, yeah, it's traditionally done by counting backwards. The prophet um, death date is um, established uh, actually by um, uh, later sources, which use the Hijra calendar. So our first accounts of the Hijra calendar. And then so you go back to establish a Hijra around 622. And then uh, you count forward for the 10 years of the Prophet's life in Medina and you get 632. And then you go back to get the Prophet's birth around 570. I mean, e even the traditional sources, though, where you're thinking about uh, how to locate the Prophet's 
birth, um, you know, it's associated with the year of the elephant. Right. And there are issues there, too, um, because, uh, you know, from S South Arabian sources, it seems that the Arabian king, Abraha, really did have campaigns into Central Arabia. Whether or not he actually used elephants is an open question, but he really did have campaigns into Central Arabia. But most of those, and we actually have inscriptions um, from Abraha or from you know, his his folks, uh, but most scholars date those campaigns to the late 550s. Right. And so there's some there's some problems there. So there's all sorts of open questions, uh, which I introduce a little bit um, in the book, while also sort of giving a timeline or two, which is that which just uses the traditional data 57. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in fact, you just preempted my next question, which was, in fact, about the the story of Abraha and the year of the elephant. But uh, you've already answered that, so we'll just give ahead to the next one. Yeah, can I say something about that too, Omar? Sure, I sure, think please. It's a, it's a yeah. very interesting question. Um, there's also a scholar named Daniel Beck mm -hmm. who has written about this. Uh, I yeah. think he has an article or two on academia, but he's also published that somewhere um, somewhere else. Um, I mean, the, there are interesting questions about the, the elephant. First of all, it, mm -hmm. it raises a topic which is of general interest to the book, which is relationship between Quran and Sira, or Quran and Hadith. Um, because, you know, if you actually look at Surat Al-Fil, uh, Quran 105, I think, um, you know, it's and you re if you just read the Arabic words there, Alam tara kefa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil, etc. It doesn't mention Abraha, it doesn't mention um, Najran, for example, or Southern Arabia. It's very, you know, very, very general. Um, then, of course, the hadith and the seerah fill in the gaps and tell you this is about Abraha and this is, you know, this is the common interpretation, almost universal. So uh, some contemporary scholars have said, yeah, well, uh, it's very unlikely that um, Abraha actually used an elephant because unlike Asian elephants, um, uh, African elephants were hadn't been used for centuries in warfare. I mean, since Hannibal, I guess. I don't know if you've read this argument. Um, and then, but other people have countered and said there is like wall art or wall inscriptions that have been found in South Arabia, which show elephants. And then people have responded to that and saying, okay, maybe someone brought an elephant from Africa to Southern Arabia, but they, they actually are very difficult to train and use in war. So uh, it's just an interesting sort of, I don't know, Nietzsche kind of question about how to think critically about stories we find in this, you know. Okay, that, that's interesting. I didn't know about the elephant inscriptions in South Arabia, so that really is uh, an interesting uh, anecdote. Yeah, and I, I really hope that the scholars have lengthy debates on this particular story. In fact, uh, you mentioned uh, Daniel Beck, and I think that uh, if memory serves me right, uh, I believe he may have also mentioned in his article or his book that perhaps the story of the elephant is actually a hidden polemic against the Persian Sassanid Empire. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Is it actually? I, I can't. Polemic? Yeah, I don't know the yeah. argument in detail, so I can't say anything too useful. I know he's also proposed a connection with a biblical book called the Book of Maccabees, right. where both elephants and flying, I don't know if it's actually birds, but it could be angels, I forget, but things which fly, because, I mean, the, the Arabic word in the surah is tayr, I believe it's fire, which could be bird, but it could be anything that flies. So, um, yeah, but I, I just, I don't remember the details of his argument well okay. enough to comment. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So, okay, so uh, so uh, one thing that I'd like to mention to our audience, Gabriel, is that uh, when it comes to Islamic studies, and we have the Quran and we have the Hadith collection, so normally, uh, because the Quranic uh, verses tend to be a little ambiguous, uh, for example, uh, the, the Hadith is there, to fill in the gaps. But in fact, uh, when it comes to this book and this body of work, what you've done is you've actually looked at Islamic history through the lens of the Quran. And that is, uh, I found that to be quite unique and uh, quite a, a refreshing, uh, you know, quite refreshing essentially. So uh, would you like to tell us why you took this approach and uh, what, be what how, how has it benefited our understanding of that particular milieu? Right, right. So, I mean, just basic introduction to questions that Western scholars and increasingly Muslim Muslim scholars in the Islamic world have asked about the relationship between Quran and Sira or Quran and Hadith. 
Um, the, the problem is that a lot of the stories, which, as you as you put it, uh, fill in the gaps about the Quran, um, it's it's not really clear if they were uh, authentic memories of what really happened, or if they were efforts to explain the Quran. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are many ways, many examples one could give. Um, uh, and you know, some of this is a little bit controversial. So I am not insisting that anyone take my point of view. You know, um, Muslims from a faith perspective, of course, um, may find theological reasons to object to to this perspective. So I totally understand that. But I mean, we, if we take, for example, the first what is by tradition the first words um, given to the Prophet by the angel Gabriel in Surat Al Alaq. Um, etc. Those first five verses from Surah Al Alaq. Again, it's very ambiguous. There's no mention of a cave. There's no mention of an angel. There's no mention of Mount Hira. There's no mention that Muhammad used to do something called Tahannuth. If your viewers are familiar with this tradition, a kind of meditate meditative retreat. All of those details come from the tradition, which fill in the gaps. And um, you know, so then there are two possibilities. One is, well, Muhammad really did do Tahannuth, and on one of these occasions, uh, these retreats, uh, the, you know. Either the angel Gabriel really appeared to him, or he had some sort of mystical, spiritual experience and began to proclaim the first five verses of the Quran. So that's one perspective. But the other perspective is that the, uh, I mean, the early uh, storytellers or the earliest ulama, however you want to put it, they were um, debating about, you know, what can this mean? Read in the name of your Lord who created and they 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 began to uh, uh, develop explanations. Well, it sort of sounds that for a revelation called Quran, that maybe the first words would be Iqra, same, yeah. it comes from the same root. And um, then they knew about stories of the prophets. Moses met God on a mountain. Elijah met God on a mountain. Uh, different traditions associate angels with biblical characters. And eventually the story was told. So, um, I mean, that would mean from a, a critical perspective, you cannot explain Surat Al-Alaq by going through this story. Because if you accept the second perspective, the story itself was produced by reflection on the Quran. So it's perfect. it would be circular to go back the mm -hmm. other way. So that that's sort of like the angle. This is nothing new. This is not Gabriel Reynolds coming up with this. There was a, I mean, most people credit a Belgian scholar named Henri Lamens um, in the early 20th century for sort of arguing in this direction. And there are many other examples. Um, uh, so yeah. um, you you can you can do different things with this critical perspective. You can be highly 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 skeptical. And I mean, to the extreme where people would say that there was no Prophet Muhammad, every he was he's a figure created by the later tradition. That is not my position. I affirm the historical existence of Muhammad, the basic outlines of his preaching. Um, uh, but you can also say, well, uh, the best method of getting to the Muhammad of history then is to work with the Quran itself. Um, because there's these complications with the Sira Hadith literature, work with the Quran itself, which I believe is um, an early, uh, very early document, uh, basically, you know, contemporaneous with the traditional dates of Muhammad's life. So if we do that, what sort of historical observations can, can we make? And that's sort of what the book mm. does. Right, absolutely. And in fact, I have a zillion questions just on the points that you just uh, uh, mentioned, Gabriel. But let me just try and get to each and every one one by one. Um, so, so you mentioned that, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, the book was that good. So it has the amount of questions that just keep overflowing. So, uh, so coming to what you just said about um, the, you know, you mentioned in the book that uh, there's a lot. There, there's a certain uh, number of scholars who felt that maybe the name Muhammad, which means the praised one, was an epithet for Jesus. And you just mentioned that you don't take that position, but where did it actually or, uh, originate from? I mean, who who came up with this particular theory about Muhammad being an epithet for Jesus? If I could ask put that out there. Yes. Okay. So that theory comes from a circle of scholars active in Germany, and known as Enada. Right. 
Uh, and there's at least one, I'm probably going to get it wrong, but some of these scholars are the famous Christoph Luxemburg, who wrote his own book on the Syriac reading of the Quran. Uh, there's someone named Karl Heinz Oleg. There's someone named Volker Pop. someone named Marcus Gross. I don't know if they all subscribe to this idea of Muhammad as an epithet for, for Jesus. Uh, I don't agree with this uh, idea. I do think uh, it's worth asking if um, Muhammad is possibly uh, a sort of, uh, I mean, it's already a laqab, but um, is a sort of uh, honorary name that is maybe given to Muhammad later in life um, uh, that marks him as a man who's highly praised. So maybe it wasn't his birth laqab. I think that it's kind of open. There are different... Okay, so part of the problem is when you go to the inscriptions, the pre-Islamic Arabic inscriptions, um, the name Muhammad does not show up very often. In fact, I believe there's a debate over one inscription which may or may not have the name Muhammad. So the name doesn't seem to be used very often. Um, and then in the Quran, as you know, it only appears four times. Um, so... Is possibly the Quran using it as a sort of in an honorary way, maybe something like Saleh, mm -hmm. the Prophet Saleh, mm -hmm. who's like the righteous one. Uh, Talut in the Quran seems to be the one who's Tawil, who's tall. Uh, maybe something like that. So I don't think you can argue in a compelling way uh, the case that it was not his birth name, but it's sort of an interesting question to debate. But these scholars, they also turn to... Um, the Dome of the Rock, and they make arguments about the inscriptions which are more or less Quranic on the interior of the Dome of the Rock. Um, uh, one of them has argued, I think it was Luxembourg who argued that the Dome of the Rock was meant to compete with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is where the tomb of Christ is, in that the chamber underneath the rock was uh, understood to be uh, a sort of Islamic tomb for Christ, an empty tomb for Christ. So um, uh, then there's the problem of the uh, the earliest uh, coins as well, which they argue that, you know, the earliest coins have only the first part of the Shahada. I don't know if they're 100% right about this, but I think that's how they articulate their argument. Yeah. So it has La ilaha illallah, but yeah. some of the earliest coins until you get, I think, to Abdul Malik at the end of the 7th century, yeah. don't have the second part of the Shahada. Um, and there's some other issues in there they throw in there. So, but it's not my position. Uh, just trying to do some justice to the way they talk about it. Right. No, absolutely. And I think I've heard that by other scholars as well. That until we get to Abdul Malik in 691, um, the coinage only has one part of the Shahada, but not the second part. So, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, telling us that. So, just two questions, Gabriel, with regards to Surah Ikra, which you, which you also mentioned. Um, uh, for my own knowledge. Uh, so read, recite, or proclaim. What is the best English translation for the word Ikra, if you could help us understand that? Well, as you know, uh, it becomes complicated for the um, the historians and the biographers of the Prophet because usually they understand Ikra to mean read, or at least that's sort of the, uh, um, the most literal understanding of the term. Um, and then there's the story in Ibn Ishaq, for example, that Gabriel actually held up a uh, like a brocade or some sort of um, uh, calligraphy um, and was telling Muhammad to read this, like read this, iqra, iqra mm -hmm. uh, as And that story seems to be a way of explaining, oh, explaining away the problem. And then Muhammad, of course, says, I do not read, I do not read. So, um, yeah, uh, there is the point that um, in both Syriac and Hebrew, the same root um, I think in Syriac, the imperative form is kre. Iqra becomes kre in Syriac. Um, is is used um, in like a ritual religious context as a way of telling the people to um, recite scripture um, uh, and to glorify the Lord. So um, people have made the case that this is what's going on. And in fact, Quran is Quran. I mean, the, the Quran refers to itself as with the Arabic word Quran because it's presenting itself as a new sort of um, text to be recited. Um, 
it, in that case, possibly, and this is another bit where I don't think it's maybe easy to make a compelling case. It, it could be that um, you know, and then it comes again, um, after um, that this is directed not at only at Muhammad, even if it's second person singular, it's directed at the believer or at the worshiper. And it's telling the worshiper, glorify the name of your Lord, recite in the name of your Lord. Um, I think that's coherent, but it's not, how do you make a compelling argument? I'm not sure. Okay, all right, fair, fair enough, no problem. Um, and uh, and coming to the second question with regards to Surah Ikra Gabriel, and I just wanna uh, refer to another book um, by Professor Sean Anthony, Muhammad and the Empires of Faith, and you've of course had him as a guest on uh, exploring the Quran in the Bible. Um, and he mentions in the book that uh, the Surah Ikra beat for beat matches with uh, a poem from Western Europe called the Mighty Beat. And so, uh, so, the, so the simple question would be that, do they both have a common origin story or is one riffing on the other? So what would be your position? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I remember that section of his book. It's very interesting. So this is a reference to someone known as the Venerable Bede, um, who gives his only, own sort of call uh, story, call narrative or inspiration narrative. And it's very similar. I, I don't remember, honestly, if Sean says, these are two phenomena which reflect a common spiritual experience or if he argues that ultimately there could be a common source maybe some archetype which both of the stories are uh manifesting so yeah i'll have to pass on that one sorry okay, okay. no no problem no problem whatsoever okay uh so moving on to the next question gabriel and uh, and, and as you know that i'm based in dhaka bangladesh i'm an ethnic bengali and we have this uh love affair with our Bengali language. You know, we even, um, uh, you know, for anybody who's interested in the history, uh, a lot of people actually died for the sake of making Bengali a state language in, in erstwhile East Pakistan. So, uh, so what are the, the comparison that I'd like to make is, what is the Quran's obsession with the Arabic language? Why is it so fixated on the, this particular revelation being in the Arabic language? And why is that such a big thing? Right. Yeah, it's a terrific question. And, and actually, this is one of the points where I think the Quran itself, although it may not seem so immediately, becomes an important historical source. First of all, the first point to note, and you sort of alluded to this, is that this is extraordinary that a scripture would point so often to its own language, right? It identifies Arabic as a lisan, as a tongue or a language, um, and it you know refers to it just you know repeatedly. Uh, I mean, there's so many verses to draw from. Uh, I think sort of the shura, kedalika, or lidalika maybe, or hina lika Quran in Arabi and litundra nasi, litundra ahl al Qur'an, etc., etc. Sorry, I messed up the verse a little bit. But many others, uh, sort of Yusuf again, the Arabic nature of the Quran. Uh, I think in sort of is it Ahqa 46 says uh kitab al musaddiq in quran an arabian um in sort of a very interesting verse sort of the nah uh it says we know that they say only a man who's uh, only a man has taught him and they say lisan alladhi yurhiduna ilayhi an arabian wa hadha lisan an arabian mubin so there's um it could be quran and arabian mubin so um in any case uh, despite my weaknesses, sorry, with recalling all the Quran verses, it's clear the Quran is, you know, deeply invested in articulating its Arabic language. Okay, that maybe went without saying. Sorry for all that. Um, but uh, why is it this an, an important historical point? Well, it's because um, basically there's no Arabic literature before the Quran. The Quran is the first Arabic book. Now, people may know there's the tradition of Jahili poetry. Um, but we have no written record of it at all. So leaving aside the question of its authenticity, even if it's authentic, it was transmitted orally. So this is the first book, period. We, otherwise, you just have inscriptions. So this is really remarkable. But that means, among other things, that the other big book, religious book of the time, the Bible, was not translated into Arabic before the Quran. Um, and so uh, there were Arabic-speaking Christians and Arabic-speaking Jews 
um, you know, in fact, a lot of the new evidence points to how widely monotheism had spread among the Arabs. And yet, whenever they heard God's word, they heard it um, translated or communicated through another language. And this would probably mean for the Christian Syriac and for the Jews, uh, Hebrew or possibly Aramaic, um, Jewish Aramaic. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that just means uh, there's something new happening. Mm -hmm. So people speak about sort of um, the, the message of Islam as bringing something old back, right? If you accept the idea that all of the prophets taught the same message, Muhammad is reestablishing what Abraham and Moses and Jesus taught, uh, that's fine. Um, but in terms of language, this is something new. Um, the Arabs are finally receiving uh, God's word in their own language. Um, and I think that's that says something about the historical dynamics in which um, the Arabs are beginning to understand themselves as a people, probably because they identify them, Arabic speakers, as descendants of Abraham. Um, that's a whole other <laughs> another question which we could get to if you want or not sure. um and so um yeah we have a, you know a couple of things coming together um it, something like uh, the consciousness of being one people um we have uh, the specific idea of this people being abrahamic um and then we have the celebration of god's communicating with this one people um in their own language um, and that's, uh, there's a bunch of vocabulary which is connected to this, like the word Hanif in the Quran, the word Ummi um, in the Quran, the phrase Ahl al-Kitab and what the implications that, remember that Ummi is not only used in the singular, but in the plural as Ummiyun, um, the Ummis. So um, it clearly, the, the questions of culture and language were key to Islam's emergence. Mm, absolutely. And uh, and in just in that response, Gabriel, I have so uh, a billion more questions. And so it's really wonderful that this conversation is uh, going in so many organic directions. So, okay, so let me just try and ask you one by one. Um, so uh, with regards to the Quran uh, being so obsessed with the Arabic language, and you've given a wonderful explanation as to why that is. So does that uh, point us towards a direction where we can probably say as historians that uh, you know, keeping aside whatever the theology is, that it's a religion for all people for all times. Would you say from a historical critical perspective that perhaps Islam was meant to be a Arabic religion for the Arab speaking people and Arabs themselves? So what would be your take on that? I think there are two competing ideas in the Quran about this. So yes, I would agree. Um, there's one prominent idea in the Quran that something is special is happening for this people. And, um, you know, when when that that verse from Surah Tashura, I think it's verse seven that I recited and uh, I think I messed up the end of it. You know, the, it, in English, it's something like, for this reason, we have revealed to you in Arabic Quran so that you could warn the people of the towns and something like that. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, for this reason. Um, so there's definitely this idea that... Um, uh, this is sort of like the dispensation for the Arabs. God is speaking to them in their language. And uh, there are other verses which uh, insinuate that this is in order that they might understand. Like God has chosen Arabic so people can hear the words in their own language and understand it. Instead of, historically we could think of, instead of going to a church where the priest is reciting the Bible in Syriac, and then probably spontaneously translating it into Arabic, which would be probably the case for Christian Arabs before Islam. And so they're getting it filtered through this process of translation. They're not getting the word of God itself, right? So that's part of like the, the central argument uh, in the fervor with, with which the Quran celebrates its Arabic language. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, there's more to be said there. I, I think the question of Ummi is actually interesting to discuss. Right. Um, you know, uh, there's a verse in the Quran, which, um, well, of course, is a famous verse in Surah Al-Araf, which speaks of an nabi al-Ummi. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then I think it's in verse in Surah 62. I can't remember the Surah name. It says something like, Who fil minhum 
Nike, uh, I'm forgetting the rest of it, but it goes on to explain that um, he has sent um, a prophet from their midst to the Ummiyin. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Ummiyin probably means the yeah, people who have not yet received a scripture in their own language. There's this whole idea or current that's really prominent in the Quran. Uh, it's probably more present in Meccan surahs, um, but I haven't studied that systematically. And the story of Abraham and Ishmael is in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is Medinan. So it's the idea is there as well in the Medinan period. It doesn't disappear and wholly give way to a universal idea. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that um, when the Quran uses the words nas, people, or even when it uses uh, alamin, um, the worlds, um, it, it's not always obvious that these are references to like all of humanity, which is often, you know, to people who really like Dawa, it's often taken that way. Like the Quran is meant for all of humanity. And so we have to spread it to all of humanity. Um, I think there are cases where that is probably the best reading, um, but there are other cases where it means, no, the people here, um, alamin, I think usually means people, not worlds. Um, we could speak more about that. Um, you know, but definitely, you know, there's definitely a universal um, element to it because the Quran also preaches to Ahl al-Kitab. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in Surat Al Imran, it preaches to Ahl al Kab, Ya al Kitab, Lima tu Hajuna fi Ibrahim. Why are you arguing about Abraham? And the Torah and the Gospel were only revealed after him. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I think both are there. Okay, awesome. Uh, you mentioned Meccan Surah in your answer, Gabriel. So, uh, but as I recall, uh, you were also one of the scholars who thought that separating surahs into Meccan and Medina is problematic. So have you been won mm -hmm. over to that argument or do you still maintain your position? I've been partly won, won over, um, uh, but I think my, uh, my feelings still won't satisfy most scholars. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the dominant view, I'm in the minority. My skepticism about Mecca and Medina is a minority position. The dominant view, I'm just talking about Western scholars, not, not sort of the believing communities. The dominant view is, uh, you know, Meccan sort of come from Mecca, Medina sort of come from Medina. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said about this. Nikolai Sinai it represents the dominant view. Very careful, brilliant scholar. By the way, he has this new volume out called Key Terms of the Quran, which is just extraordinary. Uh, he's much smarter than I am, uh, too. <laughs> so I can't really go toe to toe with him, but I'm I'm still stubborn. So, I mean, clearly people have made the point that uh, we have distinct bodies in the Quran or distinct corpora, as people would say. You know, there's vocabulary which is grouped in the Meccan period and there's vocabulary that's in the Medina period. There are themes uh, that are just in the Meccan surahs. There's themes that's only in the Medina surahs. Um, so, but my skepticism is essentially um, when people take that too far, mm -hmm. they have what I think is a simplistic idea of how the Quran went from proclamation from the Prophet's mouth into the written scripture that we have before us. Um, and they tend to avoid the possibility that uh, there were stages of continuous work on the text, development. Um, sometimes the most that they'll grant is, okay, this one Medinan verse was inserted into a Meccan surah, like surah the Nahal or something. It's just inserted. Um, but honestly, our, the lessons we've learned from the development of similar texts, including the New Testament, but others as well, tell us that codification and editing is usually more complicated. It uh, usually involves more reshaping of the text. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it can be, uh, well, no, I think it is simplistic mm -hmm. to assume that a Mecca sort of actually only comes from Mecca and was not reworked or reshaped. Right. And uh, in fact, I was going to ask um, the, the problem of redaction. I mean, I'm, I obviously don't know the nitty gritty of how the problem of redaction is addressed, but uh, would you happen to have a comment on that? Or is that problematic at all to be able to figure out what is redacted and what isn't or anything at all that you'd like to add to it? Right, so, I mean, redaction is, um, 
uh, basically another term for the the editing of a text, but its redaction is usually used uh, in the classical and for classical text and editing for modern text. Um, yeah, so um, redaction um, would involve, for example, um, uh, the the possibility that um, uh, someone found something that needed to be explained in the text um, and uh, maybe added a verse to explain that. Okay. And there's some cases of this, like in sort of 70, I think it's verse four yeah. is a longer verse. And I think in verse three, God is called Dhu al mm -hmm. um, which is, has something to do with ascension. And then um, in verse four, the verb related to Ma'arij, Araja, is used in a long verse. Mm -hmm. So a critical scholar would look at that long verse four and say, well, a redactor inserted this verse to explain the reference to Dhu al Ma'arij in verse three. So that's one one form of redaction. But another question of redaction is when you have parallel narratives. Mm -hmm. So like the stories about um, who Nuh and Hud and uh, Saleh and Shu'eb and other prophets, which appear in you know many different surahs, 7, 11, 26, and others, um, they're a little bit different every time. This has been obviously worked on by Muslims for centuries. But Western scholars, when they look at these they ask the question, okay, how has it been shaped for the purposes of this surah, surah the shuara? You know, what was an editor possibly concerned about fitting it in, in an elegant um, or uh, theologically strategic way in this surah? Um, so, uh, and then, I mean, a last thing that I'll add, because there's so much to say, and I should cut myself off. Um, I've worked a little bit on doublets in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is an element of redaction. You have not repeated stories, but just, you know, repeated phrases. Mm -hmm. You know, like a verse here is almost identical to a verse there. Um, and, uh, you know, doublets can sometimes be produced um, by redaction when um, an editor had a verse before him um, and it's within a text block and then he had another text block text block b and saw that this verse would be useful for some reason in text block b and so a doublet is produced so all of these things you know are, are very typical it happens in the gospels uh, the formation of the gospels um obviously these are complicated things to speak about theologically you know christians have been you know troubled and had to work through theologically what this sort of textual study could mean um, and how to defend still, you know, Christian faith, yeah. you know, Muslims, uh, you know, it's completely legitimate to uh, accept the idea of redaction and just, you know, develop new ideas of inspiration, how God worked through the community, how God worked through editors, you know, or Muslims may be just completely secular and not interested in the theology and just say, no, this is a good historical critical approach. So anyway, those are some thoughts. Okay, thank you so much, Gabriel. That's a wonderful comprehensive answer. And uh, while we're talking about redaction and editing of the Quran, uh, Gabriel, I just wanted to break, briefly touch upon the mystical letters that precede some of the surahs. So I think there's 29 surahs which have the mystical letters. Uh, do, does, do those letters have anything to do with the compilation of the Quran or the blocks I think of they do. surahs? I think they that? do. I think they do. And you, you've probably seen some of the studies somewhere about this. But I mean, there are certain features of these letters that are like telltale features. Um, so you've probably heard that um, the the so-called disconnected or mystical letters, they represent every consonantal form of the Arabic alphabet. Mm. Um, and no form is represented by more than one letter. Um, uh, so like you have, for example, Ra is represented, but Za is not, right. um, but every single form is represented, um, of the Arabic alphabet. Uh, and then more important than that, in my humble opinion, is that, um, certain blocks of sodas with the same letters mm -hmm. are grouped together. Yeah. Um, even when, um, some of those sodas are too short mm -hmm. uh, or too long 
for that place within the 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 Quranic corpus. So, for example, you have like um, Alif Lam Mim Ra or Alif Lam Mim surahs, uh, including I believe Surah the Nahal, but I'm gonna check. <laughs> uh, yeah. But Surah the Nahal, Surah 16. Yeah. Um, hopefully, I'm getting this right. Um, no, it's not. It's the it's the sort of right. It must be sort of the Hajr. Uh, yeah, sort of the Hajr is Alif Lam Ra verse uh, sort of fifteen. Um, but it it's 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 shorter than the verses that come than the sort that come after it. Um, similar with the Hawamim, um, sort of that have Hamim. Um, the the general principle of ordering the Quran from longer sort to shorter sort is broken by this block. So mm -hmm. they were kept together. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's that's the best idea for these letters, that they um, were sorts of labels that uh, kept certain blocks of sodas together. They reflect a very early um, element of the canonization process of the Quran. Um, of course, in tafsir, you have many other ideas about the letters, but that's my opinion. Right, absolutely. And uh, uh... Uh, so uh, one one more question which I had, Gabriel, is with regards to how important or how significant is it for historical critical scholars to have the Sunni and the Shia tradition working in parallel? And does that help our his, our understanding of historical Islam? Uh, if you'd like to comment on that. Definitely. Yes. So um, great. Yeah, great point. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, turning a little bit more to um, the Akbar or the narratives mm -hmm. of Islam's emergence. Um, yeah, it's it's very important to remember that um, these narratives are emerging in a sectarian context. Um, you know, in my humble opinion, so um, you know, you have traditions starting to form, um, maybe under Zuhri, for example. So the late Umayyads, you have, you know, in, again using the common era, you know, Zuhri dies, I think, around seven forty. Mm -hmm. um, so under the late Umayyads, you have these traditions beginning to circulate, but very early on as well, you have Alid tradition circulating. Mm -hmm. I think Jafar al-Sadiq, the sixth uh, Shiite Imam, dies in the 750s. So around the same time, there are traditions associated with him, neither in the case of Zuhri nor in the case of Jafar al-Sadiq, I believe, are these reports uh, written down in their lifetime, but they're transmitted orally. And then, you know, on the Sunni side, you have people like um, Ibn Ishaq, of course, and Muhammad Ibn Rashid, who are picking these up and writing them down, um, even though usually we don't have their original version. In the case of Ibn Ishaq, it's transmitted by uh, Ibn Hisham. In the case of Muhammad, it's transmitted by Abdul Razak, I think, the Sanani. So um, I don't know as well the Jafar Sadiq, how that's transmitted. I think um, uh, Ehab Bedawi of Leiden University is working on those those questions. Um, so, but uh, I mean, this is a time where there are all sorts of uh, allied challenges to the to the uh, to the Umayyad and then the early Abbasid Caliphate. I mean, the Abbasid Revolution in part reflects these claims because part of the Dawah of the Abbasids is that. Uh, we are closer to the Prophet's family than the Umayyads um, because of Al Abbas. So um, this is always there's consciousness of this competition between the Alid claims and you know what becomes the Sunni claims. Um, I think it's yeah debated where where do you uh, mark the beginning of Sunnism, um, but we can say the non-Alid claims that you know support the Khulafa Rashidun. Uh, yeah, so. Um, and the way Western scholars have often done things is to say, well, Sunni Islam is sort of standard Islam, and then Shiism sort of appears later on as a deviation. Um, maybe, you know, when the 12th Imam goes into occultation or Reba. But in fact, we have sort of like a whole um, flux of different traditions in this late Umayyad, early Abbasid period competing with each other. And some attentiveness to that, I think, is important for a historian. Mm, interesting, wonderful. So thank you so much for that, Gabriel. And uh, uh, just wanted to very quickly touch upon the Islamic modernists. And you, of course, mentioned uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founding father of Pakistan in your book as well. And uh, I had an opportunity to talk to Barrister Yasser Latif Hamdani. He's Mr. Jinnah's biographer. Oh, wonderful. We, yeah, we did an episode with him. But in your opinion, Gabriel, um, what exactly was Mr. Jinnah's objective in 
uh, in creating Pakistan? Was he looking to form a theocratic state or was he looking to form a Muslim majority secular state? What would be your opinion on that? I'm very hesitant to comment too much because I'm just deeply aware of how much more you know of this, Omar. I mean, uh, the narrative that I've read is uh, plays on this idea that you know, the Jamal Islamiya and those currents surrounding Maududi and other figures um, sort of had a very distinct idea from Jinnah's original idea. Mm -hmm. um, these must be, I can only imagine, very controversial questions in Pakistan, potentially also in Bangladesh, which was East Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, is that right? Are these controversial, contested uh, ideas? Yeah, yes, yes, you're right. Um, in fact, uh, uh, what you said is, that, is exactly right, that uh, as per uh, Barrister Yasser Latif Hamdani and his book, uh, he argues that Mr. Jinnah was an irreligious uh, man uh, who was not very interested in the theocratic, uh, you know, he wasn't looking to create a theocratic state. He was looking for safeguards for Muslims in India. And when he couldn't secure that, that's when he decided to sort of threaten Mr. Gandhi with the creation of Pakistan. But instead of calling his bluff, they, they actually conceded the partition to him. And so he ended up with, he had to lie down in a bed that's that he had made. Exactly. So, that's uh, for, absolutely. So, I would highly recommend that episode that we recorded earlier in the year with Barish Yasir Latif Hamdani for anybody who's watching or listening to this podcast. And uh, it's a really interesting discussion. And I'll just end you know, by saying, that as per what uh, Yasser told me, that if Mr. Jinnah was alive today, he may well have considered Bangladesh and not Pakistan as it exists in its current iteration as the real manifestation of his vision for Pakistan because, Bangladesh, yeah, because Bangladesh is a Muslim majority secular state and not a theocracy. So, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, just, just to reflect a little bit on that argument, um, in the book probably could do better on emphasizing the prominence of um, secular Muslim ideas. Um, uh, Mustafa Akio, the Turkish-American scholar, you know, has argued uh, fervently for secularism. Um, and uh, I mean, it just it just should be said that sometimes Western scholars think, well, you know, the only options for uh, Muslims are either to believe in a theocratic state or to be atheists and just completely jettison religion. Um, uh, but I mean, uh, your um, description of Jinnah's uh, vision um, uh, basically is consistent with uh, more and more scholars today who argue for secularism and basically make the case that, you know, any sort of compulsion whether the state is using so-called positive incentives to inculcate religion or using compelling force to punish irreligion, that that actually undermines the very nature of Islam, which right. is about this rational appeal. Yep. Um, uh, you know, as the Quran says, it's a, a rational appeal, which, you know, invites your intellect to consider these claims. Mustafa Akil makes a very strong case that you know, Muhammad himself um, was faced with with blasphemy, for example. Uh, I mean, according to the traditional story uh, in both Mecca and Medina with people who are opposing him. And um, I mean, the Meccan case is, is especially interesting because when he was faced with blasphemy, he either, um, in like in Surat al-Kafirun, said, you go your way and I'll go my way, um, or he responded. But uh, there wasn't this idea of, um, I don't know, the Arab, modern Arab, standard Arabic uses tajdif. And it was this idea of tajdif, of blasphemy that needs to be punished by the state for this or that reason, and the state must intervene. So um, I, I think there's, uh, e even Western scholars should appreciate more the coherence of a Muslim secular position. Mm, absolutely. And, and I think that's really well said, Gabriel. So thank you so much for that. And of course, uh, Mustafa Akil, I, I actually read one of his books, The Islamic Jesus. I, I have uh, two more of his books. I haven't finished those yet. I hope to get him on the podcast someday, but yeah, I haven't right, heard back right. from him yet. But yeah, thank right. you so much for that. Okay, so uh, at this point, Gabriel, I have to say that I've pretty much exhausted all of my questions for the episode. But before we let you go, I do have uh, a, a few surprise guest questions for you. So with your permission, I would like to just read those out. And so yes. the first uh, surprise guest question that we have is from Professor Dr. David Penchansky. He's the author of the book, uh, Solomon and the End. And you, of course, had him on Exploring the Quran and the Bible. It's a fantastic episode. 
I really encourage everyone to uh, look out for that episode. And so Dr. Penchansky's um, question to you is, um, Dear Gabriel, I am honored to ask you a question as your scholarly activity has in many ways uh, shaped my understanding of the Quran and the vast field of Quranic studies. My question is, I am disturbed by the facile acceptance by most scholars of the historical division of the Quran into Meccan and Medina and surahs. Is my agitation unwarranted? Are there any more helpful ways to organize the surahs? So yeah, there you go. Terrific. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Panchansky. Uh, yeah, the on honor is mine that you took the time to ask a question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I find it troubling as well. Uh, I think it's a sign that Quranic studies um, is still developing <laughs> and uh, can develop more um, critical ways of understanding the formation of the text that will help us better understand the, the emergence of the Quran. Um, and ultimately, early Islam, the Prophet's life, all of that. So um, I, I think in some ways the easiest path forward is just to assume Mecca and Medina, and then you can compare one to the other. Um, but it's it, that doesn't mean um, that we're actually uh, describing reality when we do that. And so... Um, yeah, there's a lot of work that is being done um, currently by um, scholars who are looking at um, questions of redaction. Devin Stewart has worked on this uh, and the possibility that um, we, we might need to think of stages of the Quran, the formation of the Quranic text, um, which could involve different sources and could involve layers of editorial work. Um, computers are our friends in this task. Mm -hmm. um, Andy Bannister has done some work using applying computers to, um, you know, uh, what what he calls formulas in the Quran, but they, they are, you know, a digital analysis of the text ca can also produce uh, more uh, data. Um, Tommaso Teze, an Italian scholar, has made some arguments based on analyzing uh, groups of vocabulary, um, and then there's my doublets article as well. Um, so yes, I think, but the key the key step is. Um, for me, is not to assume that the Quran is a verbatim transcript and to be open to possibilities of, even at a very early stage, the formation of the Quranic text. Okay, okay, wonderful. So I'm sure that uh, Professor Penchansky will be thrilled uh, by that particular answer. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Um, and so uh, the second guest question that we have, Gabriel, is also somebody who's extremely indebted to you for the way you've been so gracious to him in his scholarly career. And his name is Dr. Javad T. Hashmi, and uh, you've had him on the show as well on exploring the Quran and the Bible. And he was also very nice enough to send us a question. So let me just read it out to you. So uh, Javad Hashmi says, uh, "Dear Professor Reynolds, I would like to—I would first like to personally thank you for your continued support of junior academics like myself. You are truly a kind soul. As for my question, it would simply be: Where do you see the field of Quranic studies 50 years from now? How will it look different?" What are some things that you hope for? And what do you want your lasting contribution to the field to be? Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful question. And I'm embarrassed by the praise. Thank you, Javad. I don't deserve it. Thank you. Um, I think there are exciting things happening in Quranic studies. Um, uh, the most exciting um, is uh, the new generation of scholars now, which include Javad. Um, who are working on the Quran. Some of these scholars, are, almost all from Muslim heritage, um, some of these scholars are just blazing new paths in using different languages, you know, studying the languages of late antiquity, Greek and Syriac and Ethiopic and all of these languages. Um, some of them are working on uh, epigraphy, like Ahmed Jalad, um, Haytham Sidki as well, has worked on inscriptions as well. Um, you have a, a new generation of scholars which is breaking down this simplistic division in Quranic studies between non-Muslim Western scholars and Muslim scholars uh, who only do confessional theological work. That is broken down now. And like, alhamdulillah, that, you know, now um, you have a new generation of scholars who are doing critical work. Some of them also do sort of applied constructive theological work, which is great. And some of them are just interested in the historical critical work. Um, yeah, I anticipate um, that uh, this sort of work, uh, especially 
um, on, on inscriptions and understanding the historical context would develop significantly in the next uh, 50 years. And um, I think my, uh, my contribution will be, you know, in a special way through my students, my conversation partners like Javad, but I've had some wonderful students um, at Notre Dame who are working in Quranic studies now. So I don't think, honestly, my contribution will through my, be through my books. I think they will be, all be superseded by better books. But um, I, I, God willing, my contribution to who will produce their own work. Mm, absolutely. And of course, if I can just speak for myself, Gabriel, that I really appreciate all the scholarly work that you've done. And your books in particular have really helped me to understand uh, this field a lot better, especially historical, you know, critical Quranic studies, Islamic studies. So, yes, your contribution is, uh, you know, immeasurable, I would have to say. So thank you so much for that. OK, so thank let you. me just. Yeah. So let me just conclude by saying that for our viewers and listeners who have been with us all this time, thank you very much for staying till the end. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you're watching this on YouTube. You can also download it on Apple, Google, or Spotify. The book, once again, is The Emergence of Islam, the second edition by Professor Dr. Gabriel Said Reynolds. Be sure to go out and buy the book. It's a fantastic book written by a fantastic scholar. Be sure to get his other book as well, Allah, God in the Quran. Um, now Gabriel, my thanks to you again. Uh, you've been a wonderful guest, and I really enjoyed talking to you as always. And I really hope to have you back once you're done writing your other book, which you mentioned in our in our last episode. I think you mentioned that it was called Christianity and the, the Quran, if I'm not mistaken. How does that come That's correct. That's okay. correct. Yeah, I submitted it to the publisher. So it would, yeah, it would be a pleasure. And I'm really grateful for your work. Um, the podcast is terrific and glad to be with you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time once again, Gabriel. And uh, so have a good day and we'll catch up again once that book comes out. So my thanks to you once again. Thank you.